Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 268 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Well, here we are, back at that hectic time of year again, the holidays. Can you believe how fast 2019 went by? For many of us, the holidays provide us with time to spend with our friends and family. And this year, I'd like to introduce you to several of my friends, three of my five teammates on the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team. Over the next three episodes, you'll meet my colleagues, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. In turn, Joe, Holly, and Karen will share their favorite episodes with you and tell you why those episodes are their favorite episodes. Then, on December 31st, I'll share one of my favorite episodes with you. Now, we begin our team favorite series with Joseph Edelman, an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University in Massachusetts and assistant editor of digital initiatives at the Omohundro Institute. You may remember Joe from episode 243, when he shared details with us from his book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News. And now, Joe's back to tell us a little bit more about his work with the Omohundro Institute and which episode stands as his favorite episode. Hi, I'm Joe Edelman, and I'm an assistant producer on Ben Franklin's World and the assistant editor of Digital Initiatives at the Omohundro Institute. So what that means is that I work with Liz and the rest of Team BFW on doing history episodes and planning those series, on commissioning and editing posts for Uncommon Sense, the blog at the OI, and working on the OI's social media accounts. My favorite episode is from 2018, and it's Liz's interview with Nick Bunker about his book, Young Benjamin Franklin, which is episode 207. I really like this episode for a couple reasons. So first of all, I really like Benjamin Franklin, like the actual Benjamin Franklin, not just Ben Franklin's world. And so this episode, it kind of appeals to me for that reason. And I also like it because Bunker, in talking about the book and in the book itself, give some genuinely new perspective on Benjamin Franklin, somebody who has had a lot written about him. So for example, he goes a lot deeper on the English roots of Benjamin Franklin's family, actually looking back several generations into Ecton, the village where his father had come from, and looking really seriously at the time that Franklin spent in London in the 1720s when he was a young man learning about the printing trade and the business of printing and also getting involved in 18th century science. And then the last reason is that it gave me a really fun counterfactual, which Liz didn't include in the time warp. There's a great time warp. But the question I have is that at one point, Bunker mentions that Franklin, when he left Boston in 1723, was actually trying to go to New York. And he talks in his autobiography that he couldn't find any work in New York. And so he continued on to Philadelphia, which has a real big impact. He does. And that decision on the history of Philadelphia, because he helps found institutions there, the University of Pennsylvania. And so I've been chewing on ever since the idea of, well, what if Franklin had found work in New York? What if he'd stayed there and never made it to Philadelphia? How would the history of the middle of the 18th century in New York and Philadelphia look different? And how might Franklin's life look different from that perspective? So those are the reasons I really like this episode. Now let's take a listen to Liz and Nick talking about young Benjamin Franklin. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Nick Bunker. Hello, Liz. It's great to be with you. Now, Nick, Just to start with the obvious here, you're British, and yet you've written books about the pilgrims who sailed to Plymouth and the origins of the American Revolution, and now about the early life and career of Benjamin Franklin. So how do you, as a former journalist and investment banker and a Briton, come to study and write about these early American history topics? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, I will have to plead guilty to having been a a daily newspaper journalist in the UK for uh, about eight years. I was chiefly with the Financial Times. And then indeed I was. For 10 years, I worked on the London Stock Exchange as a securities analyst, securities broker. But really the banking was just something I did to make a living. In terms of my interest in American history, that goes back a long way further. 
I, mean, I was a graduate student at Columbia after I left uh, Cambridge University. But in my case, really, uh, it began with Watergate, actually. Back in the 70s, when I was at my grammar school, television screens every night were filled with the latest stages of the Vietnam War and, of course, with Watergate, Richard Nixon, and all the rest of it. And I had a superb history teacher at school, a chap called Dennis Winter, who encouraged me to study uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. So that was actually the first thing I actually studied seriously in terms of American history, the uh, period of the 1930s, which he thought was kind of relevant to what was going on in the 1970s. So that's where it began. And then, of course, I've spent a lot of time in the United States, traveled backwards and forwards. And what I try to do in these books is I try to explore what the academic jargon calls the Atlantic world or Atlantic history. And I try to show people ideas, goods, cargo ships moving to and fro across the Atlantic. And I try to take the reader with me backwards and forwards. And this is something that was very much a theme of Benjamin Franklin. I mean, he was a very mobile kind of person moving back and forth between these cultures. And what I'm doing is trying to explore how Franklin came out of that kind of intermingling of different aspects of the Atlantic world of his period. Well, that's definitely true. Franklin really did travel back and forth quite a bit. I mean, he made what, three trips to England alone and another trip to France and then traveled around Europe while he was there? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yes, he did. He did. And in terms of my background with economics and finance and so on, well, that's a bit helpful with this kind of thing. I mean, when I was writing Emperor on the Edge about the events leading up to the Revolutionary War, it was obviously very useful in terms of writing about the Boston Tea Party and the East India Company and the tea trade. It was very useful to be able to draw upon my background in business and finance and banking. But really, with regard to Benjamin Franklin, it's really I'm much more interested in the people. I mean, this book has a bit of business in it, but... Really, it's more to do with science, actually. If I were giving it an alternative title, other than Young Benjamin Franklin, Birth of Ingenuity, I would call it A Portrait of a Scientist as a Young Man. Speaking of Franklin and his scientific achievements, there have been many people who have written biographies about Franklin, sometimes as a scientist, often about his role in the diplomacy of the American Revolution. But you chose to write a book called The Young Benjamin Franklin, which really focuses just on his early life and career. What was it about this aspect of Franklin's life that attracted you? I mean, what made you want to study and write about the young Benjamin Franklin? Well, this is the most neglected period of his life. And I like to study things that have been a bit neglected and where I think I can add value genuinely by producing new information, new insights. I don't really want to be in the business of recycling or regurgitating what is already known. And as I say, the first half of his life, which I'm dealing with here, is the period that's neglected partly because some of the material that one needs to look at is, is less well known than it ought to be, or in fact, hasn't been known at all before. Now, maybe the best thing to do is to start at the end of the book. Now, book falls into five sections, and the final one is called The Dawn of American Science. And what I deal with at the kind of climax is that period in late 1746, early 1747, when Franklin was just about to turn 41 years old, and this was the moment at which he suddenly began these intense experiments with electricity. And it was these intense experiments with electricity that really made his name. I mean, he was well known by that stage as a very successful printer and a respectable public servant in Pennsylvania. But beyond his close circle of friends, people really weren't aware of just what a great polymath he was and just how much knowledge he had of philosophy and science and so on. So what I'm doing is I'm trying in this book to get at the question of, how did Franklin come to be at the age of 41, someone who could embark upon this highly original, you know, brilliant scientific career? What was it in his background that produced this kind of talented individual, this exceptionally talented individual? And what was the kind of mix of cultures that went to produce him? So that's what I'm dealing with. And then I work back, the whole of the book is an attempt to get at the answers to those questions. What in the first 40 years of his life and in his origins, his family origins in England, was it that made him the genius he was going to become? I'm really glad you brought up the origins of Franklin's family in England, because one of the really neat aspects of your book, Young Benjamin Franklin, is that you actually took the time to explore the English origins of Franklin's family. And a lot of Franklin biographers really don't make this effort. So since you did do this work, what can you tell us about Franklin's English ancestors? And do these ancestors reveal anything interesting about the man Franklin became? Oh, yes, indeed. Historians have tended to shy away from looking too deeply into Franklin's ancestry. I'm not entirely sure why that is, actually. Partly, I think it's because the British historians have not really taken any very close interest in his work. And we're the people in Britain who are actually closest to some of the source material. 
But yes, they were an exceptionally interesting bunch, his forebears, the Franklins. And what we're really talking about is three generations going back into the early 1600s. The key figure really was his grandfather, Thomas Franklin, born in 1598, who was a blacksmith at a place called Ecton in Northamptonshire in England. It's about 70 miles northwest of London, right in the heart of the English Midlands. When people write about Franklin, they sometimes convey the idea that Thomas Franklin was kind of a humble craftsman working in a very remote backwater, simply shoeing horses, which is one of the things that the blacksmiths do. But what I show in the book is that there's something a lot more to it than that, that they were part of a very rich culture of rural craftsmanship, very highly skilled rural craftsmanship. Blacksmiths weren't just people who shoot horses. They were people who made all kinds of village equipment, agricultural implements and tools and so on. They also made clocks. In England at the time, clockmakers and watchsmiths and blacksmiths kind of all overlapped with each other. And even more important than that, Thomas Franklin, the grandfather, sent four of his sons to London to train as apprentices, primarily as dyers of silk. Now, these were highly skilled occupations. So the key point to get across is the fact that the Franklins came out of this very highly skilled craftsman culture in England. And then what Franklin did was add to that during his lifetime, not just the skills of his hands, but also, of course, the highly developed skills that Benjamin Franklin had with his brain and with language. And you put all that together, language, theory, craftsmanship, you get the kind of raw material for the extraordinarily important work he did with electricity. You mentioned that British historians haven't really taken an interest in Franklin, and yet there are a lot of historical sources in England about him and his family. As you were researching Franklin's family and origins, what kinds of source material were you able to find and access, and where exactly did you have to go to find these sources? Well, fortunately, we don't just have Franklin's autobiography. Now, that's the principal source of material on his early life and his ancestors. We also have a couple of other things. He had an uncle, an Uncle Benjamin, who was Benjamin Senior, I call him, who was born in 1650 or 1651 and died in 1727. And Uncle Benjamin was a writer himself, and he wrote two things that are very important. First one was a manuscript family history of the Franklins, which he wrote in 1717 when he was in retirement in Boston, Massachusetts. And the other one was a cycle of autobiographical poems. Now, these are still in existence. They've not been studied quite as much as they should have been. The cycle of autobiographical poems, for example, is up in Worcester, Massachusetts at the American Antiquarian Society. And it's, it's attracted a bit of interest from historians, but not as much as it should, partly because it's quite a cryptic and obscure kind of document. But by working with that document and by working with a range of other sources that one can get at in England, one can actually build really quite a concrete, vivid picture of the Franklins as they were. We're talking really here about the period from about 1650, 1660 through to the end of the 17th century, all of which is covered by Benjamin Senior in these autographical works of his. And then I take them and I put them in the context of their period, and I find a lot of other kinds of documents that relate to them. And there was one particular document that I was looking at, which I uncovered, which is really extraordinary importance. Benjamin Franklin's father, Josiah, who was born in 1657, was also a dyer of silk. This was what he and his brothers did in London. Now, what I discovered in the archives in London was the original of the signature of Josiah Franklin on the document in which he became what they call a free man of the Dyers Company of London. Now, the significance of this is it means that Josiah Franklin essentially completed seven years training as a silk dyer in the city of London. Now, the reason that's important is because it's always been thought in the past that Josiah Franklin, Franklin's father, was a countryman. And what I found, actually, he was deeply immersed in the life of the metropolis. That's very important because what you see, therefore, in the Franklins is not simply that they were country people, that they were also very urban as well. They were sophisticated craftsmen, highly literate, operating in London in the 1650s, 1660s, 1670s, at a time of political turmoil, of religious turmoil, a great ferment of ideas going on, and also at a time when you're starting to see the origins of what became the uh, Industrial Revolution. You put all that lot together, and what you come up with is, as I say, the roots of Franklin's genius. Your find about Josiah Franklin is fascinating, and I'm curious if you would talk to us a bit more about Franklin's training as a silk dyer, because when I read your book, Young Benjamin Franklin, I was struck by just how much knowledge and the types of different knowledge one needed to have in order to be a silk dyer. Well, that's right. Yes. You see, what was happening in the 17th century was that this particular trade was becoming very important indeed because of the great growth of the silk industry. 
I mean, prior to the 1600s, of course, silk was worn in England. It was worn by the aristocracy, by uh, the nobility and so forth. But during the, the 17th century, it was also becoming not a mass market product, but a product also of the middle classes. Huge amounts of silk were being imported from abroad, including from the Far East, from India and China and so on, particularly from India. There was a great market for silk. And the techniques that we used for dyeing silk were becoming more and more sophisticated. So a dyer of silk had to master the intricacies of all sorts of different kinds of vegetable compounds and other kinds of dyes, metallic dyes as well. And what they were practicing, in effect, was a kind of experimental chemistry. Now, we'll be aware that one of the great developments in England in the 1660s was the foundation of the Royal Society, which, of course, became kind of the heart or the core, if you like, of scientific endeavor in Great Britain. And in the 1660s, the Royal Society actually sent one of their members down to the banks of the Thames in London, where the silk dyers worked, to study their trades, because they found it so fascinating that these silk dyers, in the course of their daily work, were doing so much of what I say was experimental chemistry. So that's the kind of culture from which the Franklins developed the sort of talents with the brain and the hand and the eye that they had. Now, earlier you alluded to the fact that there were religious and political developments going on in England during the 17th century. And I wonder, how did these goings on influence Josiah Franklin's decision to move to Boston, Massachusetts? Yes, that's right. And now you see, the Franklin family came from, as I said, Ecton in Northamptonshire. And that was an area that, going back to the 1550s and 60s, had been something of a stronghold of Puritanism. The Franklins were Puritans of a specific kind. They were Presbyterians. That means they were moderate Puritans. They weren't the very radical Puritans of the kind you saw in the English Revolution. They weren't people like Oliver Cromwell and so forth. They were moderate Puritans. And they attached themselves or became attached to a particular local clergyman, a man called Archdeacon Palmer, who was the parish rector at Ecton. And he had been a Puritan himself. When Charles II returned after the death of Cromwell in 1660, Palmer actually made his peace with the new regime and he carried on as rector. But he was an important character. He was a great influence on the Franklins. He was the source, I think, of a lot of their religious beliefs. He was also a scientist. Archdeacon Palmer was actually a very competent mathematician indeed. He published mathematical tracts. He was an astronomer and this sort of thing. And he got them going along the lines of Presbyterianism. Now, the problem was that by the 1670s and 1680s, the Presbyterians who had survived, the old Puritans, so to speak, were finding themselves under renewed pressure from the crown. And what happened was that at the end of the 1670s, there was a period in England that came to be known as the Exclusion Crisis. Now, this one, a little bit complicated, but the gist of it is this. Charles II did not have a legitimate heir to succeed him. He didn't have a son or a daughter. And so the crown of England was likely to pass to his brother, James, Duke of York, who was a Roman Catholic. And this led to a degree of political turmoil and conflict in England in which Parliament had an enormous face-off with Charles II which was won by Charles II, Charles II won. And by the early 1680s, therefore, the crown was on the offensive, so to speak, against its opponents. And they were engaged in a kind of renewed persecution of Presbyterians such as the Franklins. And this was really what led to the departure of Josiah Franklin to the colonies in 1683. He was one of those people, not only a very competent craftsman, but also a devout Presbyterian, who decided he couldn't really live with this new regime. And so he decided to up sticks. He left uh, Oxfordshire, where he was living at the time, traveled down to London, and made his way to Boston, Massachusetts. He was one of the one huge number of people who did this at the time, but nevertheless, he was one of them. So when did Josiah land in Boston, and what was it like for him to live in this colonial seaport town after spending so much time in the giant metropole of London? Well, he landed October 1683, which is an important date, because this was the date also at which the Crown and England were also trying to intervened to remove some of the civil liberties that were enjoyed by the people of Massachusetts. And the people of Massachusetts had enjoyed something more or less akin to self-government since the foundation of Boston in 1629. In the 1680s, Charles II was essentially trying to remove those liberties and to bring them under closer subjection to royal authority. So that was the moment at which Josiah and his wife arrived. And not just his wife, he had a family of children as well. Now, you might think, therefore, that when Josiah Franklin got to Boston, he would be treated as something of a hero and he would be welcomed with open arms. But in fact, all the available evidence suggests the reverse, that actually he had to take a downgrade in his social status. In London and in Oxfordshire, he had been a highly skilled craftsman. He had a degree of social status. He could vote in elections. He was a member of his local Presbyterian congregation and so on. 
when he got to Boston, he had to start again completely from the bottom, you know, from ground zero, as it were, and make his way. And it was a good number of years before he was even accepted as a member of the Old South Meeting House, which was the meeting house which uh, he wished to join, that is to say, the, the church. So it was a long struggle for the Franklins in Boston to recover the kind of standing they had already won in England. What was it like for Josiah Franklin to see work as a silk dyer in Boston? I mean, Boston is just not a place that we think of as having lots of silk in the 17th century. Well, that's a very interesting question. Now, he may have thought he could do it because actually there were substantial amounts of silk being exported from London to Boston at the time. This is something I came across in the shipping records from the city of from the Port of London. The ships on which people like Josiah travel actually also carried large bundles of silk. Now, it's not clear actually what happened to those bundles of silk when they got to Boston. It may be they were shipped onwards to the West Indies. It may be they were turned into furniture, fabrics, and so forth. But what we do know is that there was really little opportunity for him to work as a silk dyer. The textile industry in Boston simply wasn't sophisticated enough for that. So he couldn't do that. He had to find another occupation. So what he did was he kind of moved sideways. He moved into another occupation that involved a bit of experimental chemistry and a lot of skill, but wasn't quite as pleasant and as highly paid as silk dyeing. And that job was he became a maker of candles. First of all, candles, and then he went on to soap as well. Now, as you can imagine, making candles and soap in those days was a pretty obnoxious occupation. But nevertheless, he stuck at it, and he stuck at it effectively for the next 40 years or so. And so the Franklins, having been silk dyers, became tallow chandlers an occupation from which they could make a reasonable living, but not the kind of high wages they could have commanded in England. It really sounds like Benjamin Franklin was born into a very pious family, a hardworking family, and a family that did okay economically, but really wasn't on the path to wealth in Boston. And when he reflected on his family in his autobiography, Franklin remarked that he was the youngest son of a youngest son. And I wonder, as we look at the dynamics of the family Benjamin Franklin grew up in, What exactly did it mean to grow up the youngest son of a youngest son? Well, Franklin did indeed say that in his autobiography. He did actually say, yes, I mean, the the quotation, I've got it here, actually, he said uh, he was referring to his visit back home to the family home at, at Ecton in 1758, when he looked at the parish register of the parish church. And he said, by that register, I perceived that I was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back. Now, a lot of historians kind of seized on that to imply that somehow or other he was coming right from the bottom of the pile. And that somehow he may have felt some kind of resentment about this, that he felt that he'd have to do everything by himself. Now, I don't think that's really true. The fact was that Josiah Franklin and his brothers and his father and his uncles in England had always taken a great deal of trouble to actually ensure that all the sons in their families had work to do. And in fact, what Josiah did was take great trouble over Benjamin Franklin's education to the extent that he could. The normal English practice was, if you were from what you might call the craftsman class, was to try and find apprenticeships for your sons. One of your sons, the elder one, would normally take on the family business, whether it was blacksmithing or dyeing, whatever it was. But the others, would, you would find apprenticeships for elsewhere, which is why you sent them to London. And what Josiah Franklin tried to do for Benjamin Franklin in Boston was the same kind of thing. I mean, he couldn't send him to London to train, but he could find other craftsmen in Boston with whom Franklin could work. So the issue of being a youngest son, I don't think was really that important. In any case, you see, uh, Josiah actually lived to be 87. So if any of the Franklin boys were waiting for their inheritance, they had to wait a very long time. And what was Franklin's childhood in Boston like? Well, for one thing, I think he was very happy. Now, there's a very useful account of this, which is given by a French author, actually. Now, the most famous account of Franklin's boyhood, the one that people rely on, of course, is his own account in his memoirs. But when Franklin was living in Paris in the 1770s and 80s, he made friends with a young Frenchman, a medical student called Cabanis. Cabanis went on to become quite an important biologist in France. And Cabanis recorded the conversations that he had with Benjamin Franklin in Paris. And it's very clear from these conversations that Franklin was quite a lot more open to Cabanis than he was in his autobiography about his boyhood. And what he makes clear to Cabanis is just how happy it was. He talks about the games he played. He talks about his mother in particular. The relationship that Franklin had with his mother emerges more clearly from the conversation with Cabinets than it does from Franklin's autobiography. The impression one gets is of someone who was brought up in a family that was lively, that was articulate, that allowed him to play as well as to work. There was a bit of discipline in the household, but not too much. So altogether, it was a happy child. And, and Franklin actually told Cabinets that he didn't really lack for anything as a child. Work was hard, but the standing was good. And remember, Boston had several big advantages over England. One thing was the diet was a lot better. 
the diet, the fish, the cod, the beans, all those things that are so associated with Boston. The diet was better than England. The opportunities for exercise were better than in England. And people lived longer, and infant mortality was actually significantly less pronounced in Boston than it was in England. So there are all kinds of things actually in Franklin's background in Boston that are actually very positive. Do you really think we can take Franklin at his word in Cabanis's account of what he said? I mean, it's a source based on hearsay, and Franklin was in France during the latter part of his life. And I just wonder if it was possible that he was just an old man reminiscing and being a bit nostalgic for his childhood. Well, I think there's a real problem with it because it's square with the account in his autobiography. There's nothing that contradicts it in his autobiography. It's simply there's more detail. And also, it, it seems to fit with everything we know about Franklin later on. Franklin was a very confident kind of character. And he had that kind of confidence that comes from having been brought up with that kind of a childhood. So I don't really have any difficulty with that. It squares with everything else that we can see about his character. Jay is curious about Franklin's education. He notes that Franklin attended the Boston Latin Academy and then dropped out. So Jay would like to know more about why Franklin left school and what kinds of education he received outside of a formal school. Well, he didn't drop out. What happened was that Josiah took him out of school. Now, what had happened was that when Franklin was eight, Josiah had sent Franklin to the Latin school, as you say, with the intention that he should be trained as a clergyman. Now, that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You see, the Franklins had always had friends in the clergy in England. They had their friend Archdeacon Palmer, of course, whom I referred to earlier. And they had had friends among the Presbyterian ministry and so on in London. So it's a perfectly natural thing to do. And if he wanted to become a minister, he would have to go to Harvard. And so first of all, he would go to the Latin school. But a year later, Josiah took him out of the school. And frankly, it's quite open about the reasons for that in his autobiography. It was expensive. But also, Josiah could see that the career options actually for a minister in New England at the time weren't that good. You see, the problem was that Harvard was producing about 15 to 20 graduates every year. And that was too many for the churches of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and so on to absorb. And so there were unemployed pastors. And you find this if you go through the accounts of the lives of Harvard graduates, which are very well documented. There were a number of them who found themselves after leaving Harvard at this period, really with too little to do. They would find themselves as assistant pastors in some fairly remote place. They would find themselves underemployed. And so Josiah, I think, wisely saw that actually it wasn't such a great idea to train Benjamin for the clergy. So instead, what they did was they sent him to what was called a writing school. Now, this wasn't a school for creative writing. It was a school run by a man called George Brownell in Boston. And what you learned there was you learned calligraphy, you know, copper plate handwriting, and you learned how to do arithmetic. In other words, you learned the kind of skills that would be useful for someone who was going to go into commerce or trade of some kind. So that's what Franklin did for another year. And then after that, Desire wanted to see him actually start to learn a trade, which was kind of a normal age actually in England to start learning a trade. And of course, Franklin did learn a trade. He learned the trade of printing from his older brother, James Franklin. And many historians have pointed out that Franklin ran away to Philadelphia because of the experience he had of being his brother's apprentice. And Kate would like to know more about Franklin's experience as his brother's apprentice and whether this was really the reason he ran away to Philadelphia. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, actually, because he didn't run away to Philadelphia. He actually ran away to New York. He was intended to stay in New York. But he couldn't find a job in New York, so instead he went to Philadelphia. And of course, things might have turned out very differently if he'd stayed in Manhattan. The story about what happened that led to Franklin's departure from Boston is is a bit more complicated than that. Now, first of all, you need to bear in mind that James Franklin, his elder brother, who was nine years older than Benjamin, James Franklin was a very competent, talented individual. I mean, he had been to London himself in 1717, 1718 to learn the printing trade and also to buy the printing equipment, because at that time, the printing equipment had to come from England, not least because of the lead type. There were no lead mines in America at this period. So if you wanted to be a printer, you had to get your lead type, maybe half a ton or a ton of it, and bring it back from England, and you also need to bring back the equipment. So James Franklin had been to London in 1718, come home with the equipment, started his business. But what he'd also done was he'd encountered the best of British journalism at the time. So what James Franklin was trying to do was kind of reinvent British journalism in the colonies in America and produce his own books, magazines, newspapers. He ended up founding the New England Current, which was his weekly newspaper that he started in 1721. So James Franklin was actually a very talented individual. But obviously, if you think about the difference in terms of age between James and Benjamin, nine years, there's a big difference between a boy of 12 and a young man of 21. So inevitably, there's probably going to be some tension between them. James Franklin seems to have been a fairly 
hard-driving, aggressive, talented, but pretty tough individual. And indeed, there were sparks that started to fly between the two. However, you know, they had several years of quite intense cooperation, working on the newspaper, working on the New England Current. And eventually, I think what precipitated the departure of Benjamin Franklin from Boston was a combination of things. First of all, yes, he did indeed have these rows with his brother, which were rather unfortunate. I mean, he says that occasionally his elder brother would beat him. And that was not uncommon. Apprentices were often beaten by their employers. That was something that you find in records from London at the period, for example. But also the situation was that during the period of the New England Current, this newspaper they created, Benjamin Franklin had acquired a bit of a stigma in Boston because he was seen as being someone who was profane, who was irreligious, who was a dangerous youth. And so in a sense, he was somebody who really had to get out of Boston because he was too big for the town, really, and the town didn't really want him there. These combination of factors led to his decision to depart for initially New York in 1723. Now, by 1748, Franklin was in Philadelphia, and he had established a pretty successful printing firm. I mean, by the age of 42, he was able to retire and focus on his career as a politician and scientist. And I'm really curious what made Franklin so successful that he could retire by the age of 42. So after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, that's what we're going to discuss. Do you know what makes a sneaky good holiday gift? Super comfortable Bombas socks. Now, most people don't ask for socks, but that's just because they haven't worn Bombas socks. Me, I love my Bombas socks. This time of year, I spend a fair amount of time wearing my Bombas Marina wool socks as I walk around town and Bombas' lightweight performance ski and snowboard socks. Because it's ice skating season here in Boston and ski season in northern New England. And Bombas' performance ski and snowboard socks really keep my feet warm and dry while I'm on the ice or on the snow, and they really are the perfect thickness for my ice skates and ski boots. My feet never feel overcrowded in the stiff boots of my winter gear, and they have cushioning in all the right places. But aside from the comfort I feel when I wear my Bombas socks, I really wear Bombas socks because Bombas supports a mission. Did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters? Today, Bombas has donated over 20 million pairs of socks to people in need. And these are great socks. They're made of super soft natural cotton, a seamless toe, and a cushioned footbed that's supportive, but not too thick. Like many cities, Boston has a lot of homeless people. It also has some really great shelters to assist them. And Bombas helps both my homeless neighbors and the shelters that support them by donating socks. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. So, if you know a person who's completely impossible to shop for, or if you want to give a gift that really is a gift that makes a difference, give the gift to Bombas. Go to bombas.com slash bfworld today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash bfworld. Bombas.com slash bfworld. Nick, what made Franklin so successful in the printing business? Would you give us an overview of how and why Franklin built one of the most successful printing businesses in North America and why he was able to do it in Philadelphia? Well, indeed. First thing you've got to bear in mind is the economics of printing in the 18th century. And now, it was a difficult business. It was a difficult business for a number of reasons. One was the amount of capital that was required to get the business going. You needed your printing apparatus, which was quite expensive, had to come from England, and your lead type. You needed paper. And in the early period of Franklin's career, in the period like 1715 through to about 1730, the paper generally had to be imported from England. After about 1730 or so, the Americans started building their own paper mills, producing their own paper, but up until that period, it was imported. There were also problems of getting skilled labor. I mean, printing is a highly skilled occupation, and it was not easy to find the workers to help you with the press. And also, there was a the great problem of the product. One of the problems with printing, of course, is there's a kind of speculative element to it. When you print something, you don't necessarily know whether you're going to find a readership. So it's a difficult business. Now, Franklin's great talent was that he created a very diverse printing business with lots of different types of products. And so when you put this product range together, you had a number of streams of income which went together to make the kind of solid business that he developed. And most important of them really was the Pennsylvania Gazette, which was his newspaper, which he acquired when it was essentially on its knees in 1729. And the Pennsylvania Gazette, obviously weekly paper, generating not just the income from the cover price, but also a lot of advertising. And as the Pennsylvania economy grew, which it did explosively in the 1720s and 30s, I mean, Pennsylvania really was on a roll in terms of population, in terms of commerce, in terms of trade. 
as the population grew and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia expanded, so the Pennsylvania Gazette got a lot of the benefit from that in terms of extra readers, extra circulation, extra advertising revenue. But also Franklin did was he did lots of what we call jobbing printing. He printed posters, he printed handbills, he printed official forms, he printed mortgage deeds. He had a very good sideline in printing paper money. Paper money was a big deal in the colonies at the time. All the colonies issued large quantities of paper money, and the paper money had to be printed very skillfully so it couldn't be forged and counterfeited. And Franklin was very good at that. He wasn't a great engraver, but he was good at engraving, quite good at it, and he was good enough to make paper money. And then, of course, he had the great success with his almanac, Poor Richard's Almanac, which he began at the end of 1732. And the great thing about that was that it became a kind of staple product. At its peak, he was selling something like 10,000 copies a year, going up and down the eastern seaboard. It became very popular, became the most popular in the colonies. So that, again, was a big part of his success, another part of the range of product. But finally, I mean, probably his greatest success, and I think a real bit of a stroke of genius on his part was the way he got into religious printing circa 1740. This was during the period known as the Great Awakening. The Great Evangelical Revival began in about 1739 centered on the English preacher, George Whitefield, who came to Philadelphia at that particular period. And during the period of the Great Awakening, Franklin printed a huge number of religious pamphlets, texts, sermons, mostly for George Whitefield, some against him. And these were really quite revolutionary in colonial terms because he was producing very large runs of books which were going to a mass market audience. That really hadn't been done in the colonies before. And that was probably his single largest commercial achievement. When you add that together with the Gazette, with the Almanac, with the paper money and all these other things he was doing, you had the makings of a very good business. And what this meant was that by the middle of the 1740s, he had become clearly the dominant, most successful, most entrepreneurial, most accomplished printer on the Eastern Seaboard. You know, that was a great overview, but I'm a bit surprised that you didn't talk about Franklin's first trip to London, because in your book, Young Benjamin Franklin, I really got the sense that we shouldn't underestimate this trip when we consider Franklin's success in printing. Oh, that's tremendously important. Glad you mentioned that. What Franklin did was that at the end of 1724, he did indeed sail to London. The story of how he came to sail to London is rather a complicated little political business, which is dealt with at some length in young Benjamin Franklin. But anyway, he went to London at the end of 1724. He spent 18 months in London, and that did a number of things for him. Remember, he's still a very young man. I mean, by the time he left, uh, he was still only 20. First thing was he went through what I call a kind of graduate school education in printing. He worked for two printers, a chap called Samuel Palmer and another man called John Watts. And both of these are very highly competent English printers operating in a very highly competitive London market and doing very high quality product. Samuel Palmer's product included, for example, things like books that were set in Greek and Arabic as well as in English. And John Watts was one of the leading literary printers in London. He printed for the most famous authors of the time, people like Alexander Pope. So in their workshops, Franklin really could kind of perfect his technical skills. And that was a very important thing. And also, he could start to see how the business, the economics and the business dynamics of printing worked. So he was then able, when he got back to America, over time, it took him a good few years, it took him maybe 15 years after he got back to America, he was actually able to apply what he learned in London to the dynamics of commercial, of colonial printing. But also, of course, and this is something we might want to talk about, he also was exposed in London to scientific thought and to an intellectual environment that was far richer than anything that he could have come across in the colonies at the time. You know, that sounds like a plan. Why don't we get into Franklin's science? Because it was ultimately his success in printing that provided him with the funds he needed to become a scientist. So how did Franklin become interested in science and what kinds of scientific inquiry fascinated him. Well, yes, the dates are quite important, right? Now, what we know is that by the time Franklin left London in the summer of 1726, he was already seriously interested in science. And the reason we know that is because on the way back, he kept a journal or a diary of the voyage. And this diary of the voyage is a very acute piece of scientific observation. It's a piece of really, if you like, marine biology. He was already studying the plants and animals and things that he encountered at sea, the seaweed and the sea creatures and so on. He was studying them quite closely, and he was writing about them in a very intelligent, very observant way. So that's summer of 1726. Now, we also know that while he was in London, he had met two important scientists. One of those was Sir Hans Sloan, 
who was the founder of the British Museum. And Sloane's collections still survive in London. They're in the British Museum, in the British Library, and in the Natural History Museum. And they actually include an item that Franklin sold to Sloane, which is a little piece of asbestos that Franklin had brought from the colonists. And that's still there in the Natural History Museum in London. So Franklin met Sloane. Franklin had also met a very important character called Henry Pemberton. And Pemberton was a physicist. He was a doctor too, but he was chiefly a physicist. And he was one of the collaborators of Sir Isaac Newton. In fact, Pemberton, when Franklin met him, was actually engaged in producing a new edition of the great masterpiece of Sir Isaac Newton, the Principia Mathematica. So clearly, 1726, we can see Franklin already knowing scientists, meeting scientists, and wanting to write scientifically himself. Now, I think the question is, was that something that had started earlier when he was in his early teens? And I think it was. One of the things I did was to examine the reading that Franklin did when he was in Boston. I mean, Franklin read an enormous amount as a teenager. I mean, he was an astonishingly precocious teenager, and his reading really was quite remarkable. And what I was able to show was that some of the reading he did included writers who gave him an effect, a kind of grounding in some of the very basics of Newtonian physics. So Franklin was already familiar by the time he was 20 with the basic elements of Newtonian physics, universal gravitation, the system of the planets, those things for which Newton was so famous. So really, from that age on, Franklin was already immersed to some extent in scientific questions. And then you've got to add to that the fact that he had this heritage of craftsmanship, of being able to work with his hands, of being good with gadgets, being able to design apparatus, which came out of his family background. Put all that lot together, as I was saying earlier, and you've really got the basics, the basic raw material for a great scientific career. However, as you said, he still had to spend years and years and years getting his printing business into a state of maturity so that he could eventually retire and become the scientist and the politician he was going to be. I'm curious about the role that the Junto and the Library Company of Philadelphia played in Franklin's scientific interests, because he started both of those organizations to support his curiosity and community. So I wonder in what ways these organizations, in turn, supported his curiosity in science. We start with the Junto. This was the kind of discussion group, or we today would probably call it a dining club, which he founded in the autumn of 1727, with friends of his that he was working with at the time in a printing workshop in Philadelphia. Now, the Junto really had a number of different aspects to it. It wasn't just a kind of academic or philosophical talking shop. It was a group of young men who were very lively, very aware, very literate, but also very practical. And a lot of the subjects that the Junto discussed at their meetings were things that were combination of the theoretical, the intellectual, and the practical as well. For example, several of the other members of the Junto were surveyors. Now, surveying was a very important occupation in Pennsylvania in the 1720s because the colony was expanding rapidly. The frontier was being pushed back. The Indian frontier was being pushed back. Land had to be surveyed, land had to be granted, maps had to be made. And these were the kind of people that Franklin was involved with. Surveying was a very big issue in Franklin's life. I think he was interested in himself. In fact, his uncle, Thomas in England, had actually been a surveyor. And surveying is a really good example because surveying involves a combination of mathematics, geometry, observation, involves a bit of hardship as well, actually, sometimes. And it's also a practical thing. And it also has a political element to it because you're doing it so the colony can expand in land. Not everybody wanted the colony to expand in land, but Franklin definitely did. So that was the kind of thing that went on in the Junto. And they also discussed a lot of moral and political issues too. And there you see in the Junto, you can see the origins of a lot of Franklin's later thinking about frontier expansion, about democracy, about the public life and what we would call today the public sphere. Now, when we talk about and consider Franklin as a scientist, we also need to talk about and consider Franklin as a man of faith. And Emily is curious about Franklin's religious beliefs, which is something you talk quite a bit about in your book, Nick, Young Benjamin Franklin. So would you tell us how Franklin went from the Puritanism of his parents to the man who, I guess, basically came to select and choose a custom mix of religious principles and elements of faith, and then how he reconciled his faith with his science? Well, you know, this is one of the the issues about Franklin that is most debated by historians, and that's not really surprising, simply because of the length of time that he lived. I mean, he was born in 1706, dies 1790. So he lives for 84 years during a period when issues to do with religion, the existence of God, the nature of Christianity, the reliability of the Bible, these are all issues up for debate. And he lived throughout this period. And so, of course, he had many discussions with people of different kinds, lots of letters he wrote, books he read, and so on. 
And if you take all the different things that Franklin said about religion during the course of his career, you can analyze it all in a lot of different ways. Now, I think the place to start, as you suggest, is with his parents. By the way, I wouldn't actually call him a man of faith. I would call him a philosopher, which is what Franklin would have said. Franklin would have called himself a philosopher. You start with his parents. Now, we know a lot about Josiah's religious background because of the material that's available from England or the material from Uncle Benjamin as well. The Franklins were Presbyterians originally in England, and they tried to carry on being Presbyterians in Boston. Now, there wasn't actually a Presbyterian church in Boston. There was a congregational church, but the two were capable of worshipping together. Now, the situation was that by the time Franklin was in his teens, we're talking around about 1720-ish, by that time, Presbyterianism on both sides of the Atlantic was a faith that was kind of in a bit of crisis. In England, the Presbyterians were divided. There was one lot of Presbyterians who were still Orthodox Christians. They were what we would call Puritans, not unlike the classic Puritans of New England, people like Cotton Mather and so on. So there was on the one side, there were the Orthodox Presbyterians who believed in the Holy Trinity, heaven and hell, who believed in the divinity of Jesus Christ, the authenticity of the Bible. And there were another lot of Presbyterians on the other side who were becoming more skeptical, who were moving in a different direction, who were becoming what we would probably call Unitarians now. So Presbyterianism was in a bit of trouble by about 1720. It was divided. And that's something that Franklin was kind of immersed in. He was immersed from his earliest youth in this atmosphere of controversy in which people were questioning the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith. So that's where he started. And I think what happened then was, there's no question in my mind, not everyone agrees with this, I think that by the time he went to London in 76, Franklin was effectively an atheist. I think if one reads the writings that he produced in London, he produced an extraordinarily interesting document called A Dissertation on Liberty and Necessity, which, as far as I can see, is an atheist work. But then later, he retreated from that position. He began to think that he'd been too extreme in his views. I think he read more widely. He had more experience of life. I think also he lost the desire to be quite as controversial as he had in his youth. And so gradually, he kind of settled down into something rather more kind of pragmatic, if you like. And I think eventually what happened was that Franklin, by the time he was in his 50s and 60s, Franklin had come to believe that there might be a God, there might not be a God, there might be an afterlife, there might not be an afterlife, but he could see the benefits of belief in religion. I mean, I think, frankly, you know, Franklin was a bit like the pragmatists in American philosophy at the end of the 19th century people like William James, for example, who weren't entirely convinced that religion was true, but they thought it had value. And I think that's pretty much the kind of view I take of Franklin. I think he was like the first pragmatist in American thinking. Now, a lot of historians look at the life of Benjamin Franklin, and they often point to his diplomatic work during the American Revolution as his greatest legacy. Of course, he accomplished much of this statecraft during his 70s. But Nick, your book ends when Franklin is just in his 40s. So, I'm curious what you think about Franklin's legacy and why you think it's really helpful for us to know more about Franklin's early life. Well, with regard to his legacy, there's no question that his work as a diplomat in France was extraordinarily important. I mean, quite clearly, the Revolutionary War could not have been won in the way it was if the French had not been in alliance with what became the United States. They needed the help of the French Navy. That was absolutely essential. And they needed somebody in Paris who could work with the French someone who was as experienced and as resourceful as Franklin, and also as worldly wise as Franklin. That was a very important aspect of it. And so the work he did was invaluable in that sense. However, if you ask me what I think his greatest legacy was, I think really it's the scientific work. And I think Franklin would agree with me now, if he were here now, if we could conjure him up. First of all, his electrical work in the 1750s was enormously important. I mean, he really took what Newton had done, and he went beyond it. He was one of the first people who could really step outside the shadow of Sir Isaac Newton. And his work was enormously productive and enormously fertile. But also the other thing I think that Franklin understood and thing that he did, I think was terribly important, was that he was terribly concerned with teamwork and with building a kind of infrastructure of science. Now, often I have a problem with Franklin biographies is that they sometimes focus too closely on Franklin himself as an individual, and they make it sound as though he didn't have a lot of other people to help him. Franklin was actually a team player. His work on electricity was done with a group of colleagues, friends, collaborators, and he gave them credit for that when he wrote up the experiments. He was very good at teamwork, and also he believed in institutions. He founded the American Philosophical Society in 1743. Now, it had a period of, it went a bit dormant, actually, for a while, and then was reconstituted in the 1760s, but nevertheless, he was the man whose idea it was. He helped to found what became the University of Pennsylvania. He was tremendously committed to education in general. And he always wanted to kind of build networks of like-minded individuals through correspondence and so on, and to build teams of people. 
And so I actually think that's his greatest legacy, that he was the man who really started off this American tradition of building a really deep and substantial and permanent infrastructure of scientific research. So you see, for example, in Philadelphia, you go to Philadelphia, you see the Franklin Monument, so to speak. I mean, you, you see his grave in the graveyard, you see the site of his printing shop, and you see Independence Hall and so forth. But also, of course, in Philadelphia, you see these other things, which are kind of not directly related to Franklin, but are kind of like his distant great-grandchildren, which are, for example, the University of Pennsylvania, the great hospitals you've got in Philadelphia, which have these research institutes attached to them. And all the way around Philadelphia, you've got these scientific research establishments run by whoever it might be, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, or whatever. And I see that really, in a sense, as being Franklin's greatest legacy, that he was the man who started off this kind of infrastructure of science in what became the United States. As I say, and also philanthropy. I mean, a great American tradition of philanthropy, which I think is something you can see beginning with Franklin. Before we move into the time warp, is there some aspect of Franklin's early life that we do well to learn from and perhaps use and take into account in our own 21st century lives? Oh, yes. I mean, precisely that. I mean, one of the things I like about Franklin was that he wasn't the sort of person who lives in a silo. I mean, this is one of the great themes, I think, of our particular period in the 21st century. A lot of writers have written about this. I mean, there are books about it. The fact that we tend in the 21st century to become, because of social media, because of all those things we're all aware of, the internet and all the rest of it, we tend sometimes to become sort of lost in our own little worlds of ourselves and our group of friends and people of like-minded interests. And we tend to become too specialized in our interests, and too focused and too narrow. Now, Franklin wasn't the least bit narrow. I mean, in the 18th century, people really believed in variety. You know, they talked about variety, in quotes, as being a really important aspect of being a human being. That ability to, of course, move from different social circles, to live in different countries, to have interests, a broad range of interests. And that was what Franklin was like. I mean, he had a very broad range of interests, science, obviously tremendously superb writer, interests, as we say, in philosophy and religion and ethics, and of course, interest in practical things, of course, as well, and in designing institutions, partly scientific institutions, partly political institutions. And also, he was somebody who could combine working with the hands and working with the brain. I think that's important too, that being able to work with one hands, craftsmanship, and mechanical skills are something that we're in danger of neglecting in a world where all we have to do in order to get things done is to kind of you know, order them over the internet. I think that's something which you know, we would do well to remember that that ability to combine these different faculties are really what goes to make a human being. And that's what Franklin was. I mean, he's a great human being. And now we should jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if Franklin had not traveled to London in 1724? Do you think he would have established the successful printing business he did if he had not had the training and experience he gained from the various London print shops he worked in? That's a very good question. He certainly could have functioned as a very competent printer in America because there were other printers in America at the time who did so. And he had a competitor in Philadelphia, a chap called Andrew Bradford. And it's quite entertaining, actually, to follow the kind of rivalry between the two men, which went on for a period of about 20 years, when they tried everything they could to put each other out of business. Bradford was a very competent printer, but he didn't really have as much imagination as Franklin did. He didn't have that kind of breadth of having seen all the things that Franklin had seen in Metropolis. For example, what I was describing earlier, Franklin's move into religious publishing in 1739, 1741, at the time of the Great Awakening. What he was doing there really was he was copying models he had seen in London, the kind of printing product that London printers produced was really what he was doing. So that was one element of it. But I think the most important thing, is, as I would keep coming back to, is the science. The fact that at the age of only 19 or 20, he had actually been able to mix in the coffee houses of London with people who were really very close to Sir Isaac Newton and were really at the top, which were like the pinnacles of the intellectual firm in London. I think that was the most important thing that he was given this exposure to a world which very, very few people would ever have gained exposure to, and certainly not teenagers from the colonies. Now, what that meant, of course, was that when he came back to America in 1726 at the age of 20, he then, I think he must have felt very frustrated. He must have had feelings of great frustration over the succeeding 15 years or so, 
because he knew that he had all these talents that he wasn't using. He was spending so much time at the printing press every day that he wasn't necessarily using all the other faculties that he had at his disposal. Nevertheless, I think that period in London in 1724 to 1726, it gave him a glimpse of what he one day might become. And he stuck to his ideal, so to speak. He stuck to his vision. And in 1747, when he was able to start his scientific work, he was able, if you like, to come back and resume the kind of scientific career that he had briefly had in the London of the 1720s. So, Nick, you've explored the origins of the American Revolution and the origins of Benjamin Franklin. Are you investigating further origins or other areas of early American history in your next project? Well, good question. I've got several things on the go, actually. But uh, one thing I'm thinking of doing is simply to carry on more work on Franklin, actually, because I think the scientific work, my book ends just as he's beginning his electrical experiments. And I think probably the best thing for me to do really is to be carrying on working on that particular area. Now, the scientific work of Franklin in the late 1740s, early 1750s has not actually been written about as much as it should. There are various aspects of it that I think have been neglected. You know, the big question is really, you know, how and why was it that suddenly Franklin became such an international celebrity within such a short space of time? I mean, by the end of 1752, the French in Paris regarded him as one of the most important thinkers in the Western world. And that's really quite extraordinary. And I think I want to sort of get at the question of exactly how this occurred and what it's telling us about the wider history of America. I think that's a really crucial period, this period between about 1748 and about 1754, the middle of the 1750s, just before the French and Union War began. That's a really crucial period. And I think that's probably what I'll be focusing on. So young Benjamin Franklin is really just a prelude or first volume of a larger multi-volume work on Franklin. Well, it won't be multi-volume, no, because, aha, no, no, it'll be two. Because the problem with Franklin is once you get beyond about 1755 or 1756, the source material just starts to explode. I mean, the latter half of his life is extraordinarily well documented. I mean, this is why, for example, as you know, there's a great edition of Franklin's papers that is being produced up at Yale by a team of scholars, and they've been working on it since the late 1950s. And they're probably not going to finish until sometime around about 2026 or 2027. And that's because of the sheer volume of material. So there's a sense with Franklin that no one's ever really going to be able to write, I think, the totally definitive multi-volume biography of Franklin covering every moment of his life from 1706 through to 1790. I just don't think it's doable. There's just too much there, too much material. And there are too many disputes and arguments and debates to be had about various details. But I think I can at least get as far as, uh, as the middle of the 1750s. I think I might have to stop at that point. Well, we definitely wish you best of luck with your research. And is there a place where we can go to look up how we can contact you if we have questions about Franklin or if we want to chart your progress on Franklin science? Yeah, indeed you can. There are two websites. One of them is called youngbenjaminfranklin.com, which is my domain. And uh, that tells you about the book and tells you about me. And it gives you some links. The other one is a separate website. I've got one called www.nickbunkerphotojournal.com. You can actually get to the second website through the first one. And this is really just photographs. You see, while I'm doing my research, while I'm traveling about or in libraries and out of libraries and looking at locations and things, I take an awful lot of photographs. And on that website, you'll see a kind of collection of some of the more interesting photographs and images that I've produced. This covers, for example, sites in Pennsylvania, which are connected with Franklin, but which are not widely known. For example, Franklin was terribly close to people in the iron industry, the early iron and steel industry in Pennsylvania. This is how he came to produce the famous Franklin fireplace or Franklin stove. And one of the things I did was I went and visited the locations where the ironworks were located. For example, the place where the first iron fireplace was made at a place called Warwick Furnace in uh, Chester County. And on this nickbunkerphotojournal.com website, I have photographs showing you these places as they are today and telling you a bit more about them. So there are are two websites to which you can go. Nick Bunker, thank you for this fun conversation and for leading us through the life and origins of Benjamin Franklin. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it immensely. What in the first 40 years or so of his life made Benjamin Franklin the genius he was? This was the question that drove Nick Bunker to study the early life of Benjamin Franklin. And what Nick found is, is that Franklin lived a very rich and full early life. The man who built the most successful printing business in North America, and who retired at the age of 42 to focus on his scientific and political career, came from a line of learned craftsmen who did more than just make horseshoes, dye silk fabric, and make soap and candles. These men practiced engineering, chemistry, and physics. They were all scientific men without identifying as men of science. Of course, 
Ben Franklin would identify himself as a man of science, and he'd go on to make great discoveries about electricity. Only, before he could make those discoveries, he had to learn the printing trade and the business of printing so that he could engineer himself that early retirement for his experiments. Now, according to Nick, Franklin had great teachers in the printing trade. He started with his older brother James, who had spent some time in London and sought to add a bit of London-style journalism to the American marketplace. Plus, Franklin spent 18 months in London himself during his late teens when he worked in the print shops of Samuel Palmer and John Watts. Franklin turned out to be a good printer, but it was really the experiences and education he gained while working these London printing houses that he learned how to build and run more than just a colonial print shop. It was in these London houses that Franklin really learned how to build and run a printing empire. Of course, the experiences Franklin had during his early life also allowed him to think about more than just business. He learned how to mix with his fellow tradesmen, scientists, and philosophers. He learned how to think beyond the confines of Boston and Philadelphia. It was really during his early life that Franklin learned how to become a man of the Atlantic world. So how did Benjamin Franklin become the genius that he was? He had the good fortune to be born into a family that valued education and a lifestyle that encouraged him to work with both his hands and mind. And as Nick contends, these seemed to be really valuable lessons, or at least Franklin thought they were, as he would go on to promote them by establishing the infrastructure science and philanthropy needed to thrive in North America. You can find more information about Nick, his book, Young Benjamin Franklin, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 207. If you're looking to give gifts that are fun, comfortable, and useful this holiday season, give the gift to Bombas. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. Plus, when you visit Bombas.com slash BFWorld, you get 20% off your first order. That's Bombas.com slash BFWorld. Don't forget, you can now follow this podcast on Twitter. Check out our new handle at BF World Podcast, where the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team and I will be tweeting all sorts of great and fun information about early American history in this podcast. Plus, we'll answer your questions if you tweet them to us. So follow us on Twitter, at BF World Podcast, and tweet us a hello. Finally, is there something more about Ben Franklin's life that you'd like to know about? Drop me a line, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.